first of all, let me put my usual slide up. And you'll notice a slight change. Because now it says X, X, X. Because I retire on the 31st of March. So this is my last overseas speaking engagement. I mean, I will speak overseas before my formal presentations. So as you can see, I'm finishing a lot of activities uh, slowly. Next week I will finish two more and there will be more X's. So we're getting rid of them one by one. Uh, running up to the 31st of March. And the thing I wanted to talk to you today about was something that I started doing 35 years ago, probably, which is optical fiber. I want to talk to you about testing. Because amazingly, we've all been installing optical fiber. I, my per, my, me personally, I installed my first, terminated my first optical fiber in around about 1981, so more than 30 years. <laughs> and I installed it, I terminated it, and I tested it. And I used the test methods that were established. Yeah, well, eventually. It took me uh, 15, if I can remember, 15 connections, connectors, to actually achieve four. But there was a reason for that, which we're not going to go into. But I tested it, and I tested it using the available test methods at, at that time. And those test methods haven't changed in all the years, and yet virtually nobody uses the correct test methods. Uh, it's one of the most frustrating things that when I write a, spe a specification for a job, and I give the installers the test method that I want them to use, I actually have to go and look at them on the first day to make sure they're actually doing that one, rather than what they always do, which is usually the wrong one. But it has become very, very much more complicated since those early days. So going back to my early days, 1983, maybe 1983, um, at that time, all the optical fibre in the UK being installed was multifold, all the the, the, the what we future called local area networks, because there was no such thing as a local area network. But it was 50 micron fibre uh, and some single mode. But look at the distances. We have we used to install multi-mode fibre in those days, right the way up to um, around about I don't know 2,000 meters. We were running 10 megabit Ethernet. We were running. IBM token ring, FDDI, and they were all specified to run over two kilometers of multimode fiber. But then during the middle of the 80s, we started to see more 62.5 fiber, predominantly pushed into the UK by the United States companies. But even that, we were still installing that product up to similar sorts of distances. And then into the 2000s, we start to see the change towards the OMs, as we develop the OM1, OM2, OM3 specifications in our structured cabling standards. And by that time, we started to see the distances of multi-mode drop, because the bandwidth required by the applications was pushing the distances down. And now we're at the point now where, to be honest, if I was installing a building, if the distances were more than 100 metres, I would probably start thinking very seriously about mixing single mode and multi mode at those, at older, at in excess of 100 metres. Because we have actually got to the point now where everybody's focused on 100 metres on fibre, just like they were or are on copper. 
So from 1986 to 1991, I, was, I, I ran an installation company. That's what we did. Uh, the first installation in 1983 was me working for somebody else. And by 1986 to 1991, I ran my own company. We had about 400 plus installations in that time. Some big, some small. But since that time, I've really just been a designer and an auditor and in some cases what we call an expert witness which basically means when it's all gone really really wrong and people go to court to get their money they ask me to go and speak and normally we avoid going to court and we just settle for a bit of money back and forward because usually the customer is as wrong as the installer the customer is frequently wrong uh, as much as the installer is and Nowadays, I'm just known as a standard man. Don't do very much of anything else, which is why I'm retiring. So that's where we were. Now, the problem with testing is that as these distances come down from 2,000 metres down to the tens of metres, um, the maximum specified attenuation, let's say, for example, on multimode, the maximum specified attenuation which is based upon how many dBs per kilometre of fibre and then how many connections obviously comes down also down to the point where you get, when you get down to zero then if you had such a thing as a zero length cable you just have the expected losses of the connectors um, and not very much more and in truth the specified attenuation is much higher than the expected attenuation because the cables are generally better and the connectors are better than the specification which is why the specification is a maximum. So the general principle is that most attenuation values you're going to try and measure are lower than the maximum specified ones. And that's true for single mode as much as it is for multi-mode. The problem is for installers, and if they're not clever enough to realise that if you've got a measurement error, which means that when you measure something it can be plus or minus a little bit due to the test equipment, the test leads, the test method, then as you start to reduce the lengths, there's a risk at some point where you start finding that you get results which are worse than the specified maximum, because the error even though you're actually measuring that value, the error takes you over the top of the limit. And then people get very upset and they say, oh, we're, we're not going to pay you because your results are bad. Which is really, really harsh. But that is the natural outcome of trying to measure things that are smaller and smaller and smaller when you've got technology which has got limits in terms of its accuracy. We also have to worry about if we've got a measurement offset. In other words, you're actually measuring something not just with an error, but an offset in the first place. And that gives you an even bigger problem. Now, sometimes, depending on the method you're using, you even get negative results. So it appears you've got an amplification in the fibre, which would be great because we could all buy some of that and use that everywhere. We wouldn't need to worry about the energy surplus in the world, we'd make our own. Clearly that's not true, therefore it's a test method issue. And the worst thing, the worst thing really about testing is that it's not, it was never intended to be a trap. It's not intended to be a hurdle you have to climb over. It's just basically press a button and it should say pass in the vast majority of situations, whether it's copper or fibre, that's what you expect to see. But unfortunately, if you don't know enough about fibre and you don't explain to your client what he's likely to see, the client gets very upset if he starts to see results which are misleading. I mean, we're talking here about light source and power meter testing. With an OTDR, it's even worse. If you're an expert on OTDR testing, you can generally explain to the client before you even do the test what the result's going to look like on the OTDR. Unfortunately, a lot of people these days think it's a commodity product, and they press the button on the OTDR, and the trace looks like the Himalayas, 
and they give that to the client, and the client says, I have no idea what that is. And then the installer says, well, do you know, I don't know either. But you have an OTDR test result. Meaningless, but there you are. But in truth, with light source and power meters, it's a simple thing in theory. There's a limit, 2.8 dBs, and there's a result, 2.4 dBs, good, 3.1 dBs, bad. And to explain that to the client in terms of the measurement technique is a little bit difficult. So, let's go back a little bit. And I said, back in 1983 I was using the available test methods, but back in 1987, the UK was publishing uh, a document at the time called a Code of Practice for the Installation of Optical Fibre Cabling. And it was originally written to be a British standard. I knew nothing about European standards. In fact, Europe was somewhere else in those days. Actually, it's going to be like that in the future as well after Brexit. It'll be some, Europe will be somewhere else. But back in those days, we created British standards. Only British standards. And it was a document which was quite big, which actually covered a whole range of things, and only one part of it was testing. And there, at that time, there were no written down test methods. There were no written down test methods. What there were, were about 15 people in a room with me who said, that's how you should do it, that's how you should do it, and that's how you should do it. And how you do it depends upon what you're testing. Are you testing a plug to a plug, an adapter to an adapter, or an adapter to a plug. Three configurations. Adapter to adapter is configuration A, panel to panel. Configuration B is plug to plug. And configuration C was plug to panel. Those were the only three possibilities. They still are really the only three possibilities. So we created test methods. And those test methods, those three configurations created three specific test methods. If you use the wrong one for the wrong configuration, then you either over-measure or you under-measure. And it's amazing, installers only ever under-measure. They never use the wrong one that makes the number bigger. But these were the three methods. You have different measurement boundaries, the place where you are, the thing that you're measuring is different in each case, and what we call the normalization procedures, when we reference things to zero before we make our measurement, we press reference to zero. They are different for the three methods. And the reason we do that is to avoid a measurement offset, which some people could just call cheating, which is what most people do by accident, actually. They do actually do it by accident in many cases. If you ask a long haul telecoms guy, somebody who works for the national telecommunications companies, they've got long, long lengths of cable. They don't really care about the connectors on the end. It's the cable they're measuring. So their methods that they come out, if they come and join a, 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 a premises cabling installer, their methods don't actually take too much notice of the connectors on the end, which is why they always get good results. It's part of the problem. Those methods, back in 1987, were then taken on by the USA. Those configurations are recognized in the TIA documents in the US. Uh, they were taken on by the IEC for the international standards. And only recently, only recently, comparatively recently, have we actually had some changes. And the changes <coughs> have they brought in another test configuration, which is called uh, B1 there. That's the additional one now, and that allows you to test an operating channel. It's a troubleshooting test. It's a test to do if something is failing, not working, you can use the cords that are attaching the, the panel to the panel to the equipment, you use those cords in the test method. It's a very accurate test method, but it's only valid for the equipment cords that you've got. If you change the equipment cords, you, all the results are different. 
That is the only change to the, if you like, the configurations that has happened since 1987. So 32 years we've had the same test configurations and recently we've had this extra one put in. And it, it's a good decision to make that extra one. But as I say, it's really only a troubleshooting test. So again, every configuration has different measurement boundaries and therefore different test limits. And uh, the reference to zero, to avoid the measurement error, is different for each one. And you'd be very happy, because I'm speaking for half an hour only, that I'm not going to go through the detailed measurement of each one. I'm just trying to give you the idea of the complexity of what's got now going on. So, the evolution of the test method standards, as I said before, back in 1986, we had the original BSI ones, or British Standard ones. Since that time, the IEC, and in Europe, we have the EN equivalent number. We have 61280-4-1 for multi-mode, and 61280-4-2 for single mode. And those documents are taken up and used also exactly the same solutions in the USA in the documents 526 and 52614 and 5267. Exactly the same methods. All of these people make exactly the same method. So how is it possible that installers can not, uh, not use the right one? That's for all cabling. It wouldn't matter whether you were using 50 micron, 62 and a half micron multi-mode. You, 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 you were designing cabling to run outside a building to support a camera. It makes no difference. My colleagues in ISO IEC who create the 11801 structured cabling standards, they decided that they ought to have their own test methods for the structured cabling in accordance with 11801. So they wrote, well, it started a lot longer ago, but the most recent version is 2014 with an amendment in 2018. And we got into a bit of an argument because the European structured cabling standards have to reference European standards. So naturally, the ENs are what the European structured cabling standards, the 5173 and 5174 installation standards, reference. Whereas the international structured cabling standards in the 11801 reference this one. So, because the chairman of the relevant group in ISO IEC is a German, he said, no, 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 you European people, that's him, he's a German, you European people, you need to stop referencing these documents and you need to reference this document. So, it fell on us to go and do a compare and contrast and the compare and contrast the two sets of standards for testing, the result was they're both rubbish. Impossible for an installer to understand. Lots of, and I'm not being any either one of them, very difficult for an installer to understand. The basic configurations, yes, easy. The basic test methods, yes, easy. No problem. But creating the test limits, understanding the test limits, working out why you may have got a failure, was completely impossible for them. There were errors, references that didn't go anywhere, complete nonsense. And that's what we wrote back, we said this is rubbish. Both of them are really, really bad. So we need to try and improve them so installers can actually use So. Um, I said I wasn't going to tell you how to do these tests, and I'm not. What I'm going to tell you is, on this slide, there is almost everything you need to know. For every configuration, it tells you what the reference condition is on the top diagram, and it tells you what the test configuration is on the bottom diagram. 
for each one. But there is also a concern over the launch conditions. So in a multi-mode system, how much power is in which of the modes changes the result. So if you've got an awful lot of power in the in what we call the high order modes, the ones that are going down the outside of the fiber, the outside of the core, you'll get a different result than you have if your power is concentrated in the center of the fiber. So those had to be specified, and they are now. For multi-mode fiber, they're controlled by either lights or the light source itself, or by what we call a mode controller code. But that was bad enough, and you can blame the UK for most of these things, because it's the UK, it's my guys in the UK that found it, 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 multi-mode testing depended on launch conditions. So you can blame us for all of these things, you can blame us for that, but one thing you can't blame us for is what we now have a problem with with a lot of installations, is the term reference cores, reference grade terminations. Now what a reference grade termination is, it was intended and virtually all the standards either push you towards or mandate you use reference grade terminations on your test cores and in your test adapters. And the impact of doing that unfortunately is not what people really intended. The intention of using reference materials is to reduce the error. Unfortunately, it also reduces the limit and it reduces the result. And you think, wonderful, I get better results if I use a reference code, so I better start using reference codes. Unfortunately, the results that you get are nothing to do with what the results the customer will get if he doesn't use reference codes. And no one tells you. So now if you follow the standards and you, you're measuring against a limit of 2.8 dBs, using reference codes, first of all you have to change your limit, maybe down to 1.9 dBs, for the same thing, because you're using reference codes to test it with, which are a better performance product, and then you'll probably get a result of 1.6 dBs. And the customer says, wow, that's fantastic, my limit was 2.8 dBs, I've now got performance of 1.6 dBs. I'll just go and buy some cords from the local supplier, he puts them in, measures it again, finds it 2.7 dBs. Well, you told me it was 1.6 dBs. Yes, but we're using reference cords. Well, shouldn't I be using reference This conversation, you don't want to have this confusion. So, the problem with reference grade terminations, and if you want to reduce your error, you do it, and it's a good thing to reduce your error for all the obvious reasons that I said on the first two slides, but you also reduce your limit. Do you tell him that, or do you not tell him that? But also, it will never be a result that he can achieve as a customer unless he also uses reference code. And if he doesn't know how to even specify, you know, most customers do not understand how to buy cords in general, never mind how to buy reference grade cords. Now, is this an opportunity for you to sell better cords to your customers over a long period of time? Is it an opportunity to explain to customers that you know what you're doing, so you're being a good guy and explaining this to them before you start? But if you don't do any of that, then basically they're just getting results that which are arguably meaningless because you haven't explained to them what the result should be. Now you're using reference codes. Now, there is a more fundamental question that all of those methods that I've just shown you very, very quickly, if you don't use the correct zeroing process, then you will actually get either better or worse results than you expect. We said that. Always been true. If you're meant to zero out one chord and you zero out two, and then you make your measurements, your results will be better than you can if you use the correct reference process. 
Unfortunately, some of the interfaces that you might find on connect on fiber optic cables actually prevent some of the methods being used. So it's not just a question of installers um, essentially <coughs> cheating or misleading anybody. There are some configurations of cabling where you actually can't use the correct method. Or it might be that your light source and power meter are not configured correctly. Have you got a, a power meter that you can swap the uh, adapter? Because in the middle of the 2000s, cheaper power meters were, came with a fixed connector. Could have been an SC, could have been an LC. It was a fixed connector. And if you've got a fixed connector on your power meter, which isn't the same as your cabling, or certain parts of your cabling, then you can't use the appropriate method. So you end up using a different method, which again changes the results and changes the limits. And then you're actually assessing something rather than, rather than measuring it. But the bottom line is testing of installed cabling, which used to be so easy in 1987, is now more complicated. You need more knowledge than you needed back in 1987. The complexities of light source, modal, dis modal distribution, which we try and fix these days by standardizing the, the mode fill, the, the, the power in each of the modes going into the fiber for multi-mode. We don't have that problem with single mode. But then we have the issue of reference grade terminations which we have to try and improve the error, reduce the error, because more and more we're measuring shorter and shorter links, and if we keep on measuring shorter and shorter links, the error becomes bigger than the measurement you're making, and that is a problem. So we have great sympathy for you all, and I'm very pleased to report that the, that's not a very good presentation of that slide, but never mind. I'm very pleased to report that the guys in ISO IEC have actually understood the problems with their own standard and are now going to try and rewrite it with the installer at the fore, right at the front to explain to the installer rather than write a standard which is only understandable by standards readers, they're going to try and write a standard which is understandable by installers. So that's a good thing. Pending that, and that's in ISO IEC, our next edition of, or amendment of our installation standard in Europe, EM 5174 part one, we're going to start to create information for you, the installers. And it, will, it looks awful because it's a flowchart, but it's not as complicated as it looks. It basically asks you simple questions and then points you down a particular route. And when you get to the end, you know the method you should be using. And you know what the limits are. So what we plan to do, because we have to support all types of cabling in 5174-1, whereas ISO IEC only have to support structured cabling inside premises. Well, that's what we're going to do. So the, if, if you get the idea of this flowchart running down, we'll have one of these for each configuration. So it doesn't matter whether you're starting with a panel to a panel, or a plug to a plug, or a panel to a plug, you'll have a flow chart that takes you down to the bottom point where you say, this is what, depending on what equipment I've got, what fibre I'm trying to test, what this, what that, the other thing, it takes you right the way down to the bottom and it'll say, right, <coughs> in that case, you, that's the one you use. This will not contain test methods, it will point you to the correct test method. And then it will tell you what to do with your customer, what to explain to the customer. So that's what our last project is. And now I won't be around to do that, so it will fall to some other lucky people, but we are, at least we started the flowchart. So after all these years, it started out so easy, it's now got so complicated, we're going to try and put some simple information in to assist the installer to make the right choices and then talk to the customer about what the results might be and what the implications of the test method are. So if you're using reference codes, 
he needs to understand that, that your results are in accordance with the standards, doesn't mean that's the results he's going to get when he buys cords from the local shop. Okay, thank you. I think I've used my time. Terrible oh, job. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Coming to Athens, sitting in the sunshine. Yeah. I can't imagine why anybody wants to. We'll wants. see you in the future, something. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you might. Yeah. We'll definitely be in Greece, whether I won't be putting on your picks here. Fishing, yeah. Fishing. 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 Ah, well, you obviously are a man of great history. Because the way we used to remove, remove the primary coating off the fibres with a fishing line. <laughs> yeah, indeed true. Well, I've forgotten that. Uh, one of my colleagues from the industry is actually, he keeps telling me he's buying a boat and he's going to uh, put it somewhere like Catalonia or... or my uh, Is it? Yeah, yeah. I was there last year and uh, we went there with Catalonia, yes. Went up to, what's the place at the top of the island? That's where, that's where he wants to put his boat. So, I, I next year, year after, maybe. Okay, thank you very much.